Uh, my name is Leah Yelpi. I am the president of the September 11th Families Association and also the co-founder of the 9-11 Tribute Center, along with Jennifer Adams, who I will introduce uh, shortly. And as I said before, since I, I do have some Italian in me, totally, I will be standing rather than sitting, and I could make my hand motions. Uh, I'm going to run you through some slides, and uh, we'll open it up for Q&A at the end. Right? And I'm going to zip through the slides, and I know the folks that are out there from the other places all wish they were here in New York. Where else would you want to be than New York? And we expect to see you all come here and come to tribute. Anyhow, listen, let me just, I'm going to go through some slides. Um, I'm going to start off with this slide here because somebody said they need to understand that you really were a firefighter. And, and I am a firefighter. I'm uh, retired, and this is me. Uh, here, this is Rescue 2. There's five rescue companies in New York City, one for every borough. The best rescue company in the city, Rescue 2, of course. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about this uh, uh, photo in the middle in a minute. Uh, let me move. Am I blocking anybody by standing? Uh, I'm looking at the audience, and you're all young folks, and that's fabulous. And I asked some of you about... Well, something about your ages and all that. I never ask women about their ages. Um, this is 1993, February 26, the first attack on the World Trade Center site by the same radical Islamic fundamentalist group, as opposed to the many more good Muslims that are out there. But we need to understand this radical group did this. They killed seven, um, injured thousands. 9-11... This is 9-11, right? Um, this is the World Trade Center site. This is looking from Brooklyn. This is the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, I, I hate to block anybody on that side. This is um, the South Tower. It's been struck by Flight 175, which came from the south, which is this direction, and it struck the South Tower. The North Tower, you can see here, has been struck already. It was hit up by the 94th floor, 93rd floor, on an angle. Point of impact to the roof, 1,365 people trapped or killed, no way out. The second plane, we see it here, fully loaded with fuel, struck at the 78th floor, also on an angle. Point of impact to the roof, 595 folks that just came to work that day, no way out. The only way they're going to get out is when the towers come down, right? Uh, we can't forget the Pentagon, uh, the third plane that struck the Pentagon. Um, and, of course, we can't forget Flight 93, that uh, the folks on that jet are the folks that started this, this war against terrorism. They started the fight, right? It caused a plane to crash in a beautiful field outside a small little town called Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Let me go back. I can see the... Hey, Josh, can I go back? Yeah, I did. Um, what I'm going to show you or let you listen to now is um, walkie-talkie, communications, firefighters as they're going up the staircase in the South Tower. Now, the same thing is happening in the North Tower. You're going to hear their voices. More important, listen to their voices and listen to the mission in their voice. It's what firefighters love to do, and that's you. So listen to them. Um, You didn't expect me not to cry now. That's going to happen. Listen to the voices. They're all dead. Every man that you're going to hear is no longer with us. But listen to them, right? Bear with me. Seven or four, 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 four,
Jumping. I'll, let, I'll just let you listen as we go. I think it's my finger. I'm pretty sure it is. It's me. I'm hitting it too fast. That's me. I don't want to kill all the. I don't want to kill the time that I do have here. Uh, the voices that you you heard there, they're going to make their way up to the 78th floor. There was an elevator working to the 40th floor. The rest of the way was a stair climb, and they are carrying anywhere from 50 to 60 pounds worth of equipment. Gosh, that's okay. Let me just uh, let me leave. I'll just go. The 10:45 signal that you see here is a designation by the fire department of a of a death. They made it up to the 78th floor. That's the impact floor from uh, flight 175, traveling well over 500 miles an hour when it struck the south tower. Isn't technology interesting? <laughs> this will give you an idea of what the, the, uh, the site looked like when I got there in the morning. I got there about uh, oh, less than half an hour after the North Tower collapsed. This is looking 
to the north. This is West Street, those of you that know downtown Manhattan, of course. West Street, we're looking to the north. This is the pedestrian walkway that spanned the highway there. This is what's left of the North Tower. This is the North Tower skeleton. This is Building 6. I think we can scan in a bit, zoom in a bit. Uh, you get a chance to see little specks back here. Now, these are firefighters in the distance here. This is a recovery that's being made. Uh, I, there's no way to describe what it was like to work for nine months at the site. Uh, these, in this particular situation, these are firefighters that have just found somebody. And we don't know what that means. It could be anything small or anything big. But they found somebody. You see the firefighter using a, a hose line in the back. You can see smoke behind him. What he's trying to do is he's trying to keep the heat and smoke from affecting their recovery here. The men and women that worked at this site, now, those of you that can picture acreages, this is 16 acres of devastation, 16 acres. The men and women, and it wasn't just the firemen and policemen, the men and women that worked at this site every day for almost nine months on their hands and knees found 19,979 body parts. Today, at the World Trade Center site in the museum, there are 14,000 in a special repository, 8,000 of which haven't been identified. There are still today, this very minute, uh, 1,115 beautiful people who came to work that day that we have not found yet. They're just gone, they're missing. You can't collapse a big building, pancake, 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 in the fire service it's a pancake on top of a pancake and expect anything to stay in its natural state. So in my nine months that I was there, I never saw a desk, I never saw a file cabinet, I never saw computers. I saw lots of body parts that belonged to folks. Before I tell you about this slide here, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. Uh, on 9-11, I was sitting in my kitchen, I'm retired New York City fire. I spent uh, 26 years and I never went to work one day, not one day. Uh, I love firefighting. Uh, I, I happened to be blessed, and I was working in the, the busiest of the busiest. You saw Rescue 2 in the beginning there. There is no fire company in the city that does as much fire duty as Rescue Company 2 does. So I loved what I did. I couldn't wait to get to work, and that's the men I worked with. Same scenario. Couldn't wait to get to work. So my 26 years was a lot of fun. I retired in 96. I retired young, I got banged up a bit. I was out, 2001 comes along, September. My oldest son, Jonathan, uh, 29 years old, married with two little boys, working in a special unit a squad. Uh, there's seven squads in the city. Uh, Calls me and said, Dad, turn the TV on, I turned it on. And I saw what, I'm gonna say what you all saw, but I'm looking at a very young audience out here now. Um, I saw what you saw, and definitely what your folks saw, and that was the North Tower that was struck. Uh, I asked him what happened, he said a, a plane hit it. He sensed it was a bigger plane. I said, are you going? He said, yes, we're going. Uh, I said, okay, buddy, be careful. And he said, okay, Dad. And that's the last time I spoke to my son, right? Uh, my son's firehouse sent 19 men. All 19 men never went home that night but they died doing what they love to do. And if you have to go, and like for me, it makes it just a little bit easier knowing that uh, my son died doing what he loved to do with the guys that I know who love to do that work, right? I um, got to the site. I met other dads from the fire department. It's a brotherhood. It's a true brotherhood. The dads were looking for their sons. I can't tell you how many, dozens. But eight of us stayed together, and we became known as the Band of Dads. So three months later to the day, December 11th, I had left the site. I think the good Lord said, go home. I got a phone call about 11.30 in the evening, and it was uh, chief in charge of the site for the night, who I know. And with a beautiful voice, a beautiful voice, he said, Lee, we have John. I said, great. Thanks, Paul. I'll be right in. I got a hold of my other son, Brendan. This is Brendan, by the way, that we see on the screen now. He's fresh out of college, four months on the job before his brother was murdered, uh, and he's a firefighter, right? So I grabbed Brendan, we went back to the site, 
went into the site. My son uh, was in a what we call a Stokes basket, like a stretcher, um, with a flag over him. Paul said he's all there. I said, thank you, Paul. I went over to my son. I did what I had to do to my son. And it was simple for me because I was at the site, I know. So I, I couldn't open up the body bag. So I just felt him from his toes to his head. Jonathan loved the job. It absolutely was enthralling. Brendan came over, and Brendan did what he had to do to his brother. And then in our tradition, uh, in the fire department, we carry out our own. I was able to, with Brendan's help and some of the men from Squad 288, picked up Jonathan, and we carried him out and brought him home. I couldn't leave the site because the other dads hadn't found theirs, so we stayed. So that's how I wound up spending uh, nine months in recovery work. Uh, by the way, the other dads that I work with, none of them to this day have been able to bring their sons home. They're part of the... Uh, 1,100 people that are still missing. We have a mission in life. My mission was that. The mission was accomplished. The next mission evolved, and that was getting involved with the September 11th Families Association, which is a, I can't speak a, enough about it. I speak to many people. I go to many schools. I go to many universities. And to capture people and talk to young people has become a mission. Right? And if I say to you, and I will say to the group in front of me, do you think I hate it after 9-11? And you're not going to know, well, great O, I see some heads shaking. But most of the times people will say, and I will say, you're absolutely right. Of course I hate it after 9-11. My son was murdered here. 80 to 100 good friends were murdered here. But then someplace along the line, I had to say, if I continue hating, then I'm no better than the people that did this. So we have to find a way to turn it around, right? Uh, Jennifer will tell you about what, what we accomplished. You know how many scholarships are out there? A thousand? A thousand? By who? By families that lost their loved ones that have said to these terrorists, you'll never win. You can hurt us, but you're never going to beat us. So they started scholarships. And there's foundations out there, another thousand foundations, what do they do? They go to earthquakes, tsunamis, on and on and on and on. So we turn hatred into a positive. It works exceptionally well, especially when we're speaking to young people who need to understand this, and especially since there is no education in our country. No education. You didn't learn anything in your schools when you were, uh, unless a teacher chose to, and those teachers, we have some. Um, let me go on here, because I can babble all day and we don't have time. Real quick, that's my son at his service. This is, his, this is Jonathan's boy helping to carry his father. That's Brendan. This is my son, Jonathan, with his sons. That picture that I showed you before, to, to give you a sense of what the fire department suffered. Uh, listen, Kenneth Fitzgerald lost 658 people. Fire Department 343. But the fire department is a different scenario. You live together 24 hours a day with the same guys over and over and over and over. This is a picture of Rescue 2, as I said before, uh, trying to explain what happened. Bobby Cicero it was a battalion chief on 9-11, spent many, many months working at the site. John Vigiano, his wife Jan and John had two children, Joey and John Jr., both working on 9-11. Both boys are dead. They're not coming home. One's been found. Myself, this was taken 1987. This is Jonathan, a little snot-nosed kid that came in to ride with us. He loved to come in and ride with us. Jonathan's not with us any longer. This is Pete Martin, a good friend. Broke him into the job. Pete's not here anymore. This is Billy Lake, a great firefighter, loved to fight fires. Billy's not here anymore. This is Terry Hatton. He went on to be a captain in Rescue One. Every man in Rescue One, which was 11, that came here are gone. Terry's not here anymore. You get a sense of what it's like for these firehouses that just lost and lost and lost. Okay, I'm gonna, hopefully we have time. I give it to Jennifer. What is this? This is September 11th. The site here, uh, these are workers. This is a New York City firehouse in service. 
still in service today. This is 10 Engine, 10 Truck. This is Liberty Street. Remember I talk, told you about talking positive, doing things in a good way, making sure that people understand you're not going to beat us. This little place here is this. That's what, well, Jennifer did. I just tag along. And I mean that. She's brilliant. Um, that's tribute. 3.5 million people later. Right. Let me introduce uh, Jennifer Adams. Jen? Thank you, Lee. My mic hurts. Um, thank you, Lee, for sharing that. I know um, sharing your story is never easy, but Lee and, and I, as he mentioned, are the co-founders of the Tribute Center. Um, and I used to be in investment banking. I actually worked in the North Tower for several years and felt like I was on top of the world uh, when I worked on the 89th floor of, of Tower One. Fortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, due to the dot-com boom at the time, we closed our office there and relocated uh, everyone to Miami. Um, and I decided to stay here. So I wasn't actually in the towers that morning. Um, but I did lose a good friend who was a few floors above me and worked for Fred Alger Management. Um, in the days and months afterwards, you know, many of us um, around the city volunteered. Um, and through that, I met some of the families that were actually starting this small organization. Uh, never did I imagine I would be running a nonprofit someday, but here I am, uh, 13 years later, actually running the, the Tribute Center. And as Lee mentioned, um, uh, the Tribute Center is a small museum that's a storefront, right? Literally, we are across from the World Trade Center site. Um, and for the past eight years, we've welcomed about three and a half million people. Um, the Tribute Center, the heart of the Tribute Center, really are the courageous and inspiring people that come out every day and share their stories. Um, they're volunteers, what we call from the 9-11 community. Um, family members uh, like Lee, um, survivors who made it out of Lower Manhattan that day um, in the towers, first responders, NYPD, FDNY, PAPD, um, sanitation workers from throughout the city that, that, that came to help that day. Lower Manhattan residents who had the courage to come back and rebuild their homes and stay in Lower Manhattan um, and create a vibrant community that we're obviously not that far away from. Um, but it's really their courage to come out and tell their stories. Um, about 30,000 visitors here to New York City a year get to experience um, actually hearing and meeting um, them on a tour of the 9-11 Memorial, which you'll see. This is actually Joan Mastropolo, who is a resident of Lower Manhattan with a group of people. Um, we've had about 250,000 people go on our tours um, and meet these people and be inspired by their stories. As Lee said, when, when something tragic happens, you can't necessarily change the circumstances, but you can control what you do with it after that. Um, and at the Tribute Center, I think we, we provide a place uh, for those folks to come out and to share their stories and inspire other people. Fortunately, here in America, terrorism is not something we deal with on a daily basis, but there are countries around the world that unfortunately do. Um, and hearing the stories of, of the folks here and what they've been able to do and their resilience um, is something that we feel is really important to give a voice to the victims. This is the Tribute Center, a small section of it, where you can see there's personal quotes and artifacts uh, that people can learn about the events and the history, and we invite you all uh, and your friends and family to come down. Um, as Sarah mentioned, we're having some VIP tours next week, but we as New Yorkers never really go to tourist attractions unless someone's in town or, or the folks around in other offices want to come into New York City and come take a, a visit to the Tribute Center. We'd love to have you. Um, this is actually um, a piece of one of the planes that is at the Tribute Center. Uh, obviously, we've, we've all traveled on a plane, and it, it becomes a very personal object uh, when you see it, unfortunately, fragmented like this. Um, visitors to the Tribute Center, we have about 400,000 visitors a year. We've had, as I mentioned, 3.5 million, but 30% of those visitors are actually international visitors. Um, and they come here, and we've done a lot of surveys of why do you come, why do you want to come downtown, and it's really because, as Lee said, they saw this event on TV, and they want to come pay their respects. They want to come see the memorial, and to have an opportunity to meet the people that were changed by this event is really important. Um, this next uh, slide is a visitor card, um, and at the Tribute Center, at the end of your visit, you can leave your thoughts um, with us, and I wanted to just share this one with you.
Um, so the slide didn't play, but it's actually a visitor card from a young Muslim boy uh, who said he is praying for everyone that died and for those that were that perpetrated this attack were not true Muslims because true Muslims love all people and want peace in the world. When this happened, I was very young, but now I visited and seen the place where it happened, and I feel pain. May God, Allah, bless all those who died and got injured. Um, it's a place where a lot of people come to pay their respects um, and share their support for America. Uh, we forget that um, as Americans, it was such a unique time after September 11th where so many people from around the world came to support us, um, especially from countries that were, uh, we were at war with not so long ago. Um, and it's, uh, it was a very unique moment in time that we should treasure. Um, this next picture from, from our, your offices here is actually, you can look south and see a good portion of this view. This uh, was a picture from actually last week where you can see the North Tower, uh, I'm sorry, World Trade One, uh, which is actually complete in World Trade Four. Um, and then this next slide, this is, this is my nerd moment for the day. You, some of you will share this with me. So this is what the site will look like. So um, we're missing two buildings, but they're being built and they'll open actually shortly, shortly um, in the next few years. It's amazing to see um, this, uh, the complex will be about 10 million square feet, um, which is actually bigger than all of downtown Atlanta, to give you some perspective. The second building, which actually hasn't been built, is about the size of the Empire State Building. Um, this is a skyline view of Lower Manhattan, and you can sort of see in perspective how big it is. Um, so the, at the Tribute Center, we actually have a lot of education programs from children, as Lee mentioned. Um, some folks that were too young to even remember the events of 9-11, we have a whole generation that know it was something bad, but they don't really know what it is. Um, and that's one of the things that the Tribute Center, our guides, share uh, with student groups. This is Ann Van Hine, who actually lost her husband, who was a first responder on 9-11, talking to a group of students. Um, we actually have two online toolkits, uh, which uh, AOL is helping us with a great promotion today in the Make a Difference section. Uh, to feature the Tribute Center, we have our first toolkit, which were resources for students, and then we're launching today actually our second toolkit, which is how to teach 9-11. Um, unfortunately, 9-11 is one of those things that is sort of, uh, whether it's uh, political or religious or other sort of um, tentacles that you don't really want to bring into the classroom. And it is challenging, and it's recent history. Um, unfortunately, it's hard for teachers to incorporate everything, but um, due to the feedback from teachers, we decided to create some materials that would actually help them, assist them in their classrooms, how they could bring it into different ways in which to teach. Um, but we found like the most important part was actually sharing their stories. Um, Sarah has shared some great um, cards that you all can give some feedback and share with first responders and family members and survivors. Um, your thoughts about where we are today, and I hope that our talk today with Lee and I, you've been uh, inspired. Uh, we all face adversity in our lives at some point, whether it's big and small, but it's really what you choose to do with that. Um, that moving forward is sort of your choice in life and how you can also make a difference. I hope you share your thoughts with the card. Um, so I want to, uh, I know you all have to get back to work, or at least that's what I've been told. Uh, so uh, I do want to open it up to some questions if anybody ha would like to, to uh, phone in a question or, or ask us a quick question before we have to wrap up and send you back to your desks and your computers. <laughs> Any questions? What, what's, uh, I guess, in your opinion, is the most important thing we can do in the next week or so for, in, to commemorate 9-11? You know, I, th I would say, actually, 9-11 um, was designated by Congress um, as a day of service and remembrance in 2009. Um, last year alone, I think the statistic was 37 million people in 100 and something different countries actually did an act of service in remembrance of 9-11. Um, we, along with several other groups and family members, um, advocated for it not to become a Labor Day sale day, that it become a day of remembrance um, and service. So um, I would say volunteer, whether that's at a food pantry or a homeless shelter or somewhere in your neighborhood or build a guard. You know, it's something you can do for others, a selfless act that would really be an honor and memory of those who lost. Am I, yeah, I'm working. Uh, if I had to say anything, and I mentioned it before, if, if AOL would promote the fact that we, we don't have education in this country, as Jennifer stated, and there's many reasons for it, 
but it's, it's foolish if we don't enlighten our young people to what happened to our world on 9-11, especially you all at AOL who know about the situations of the world today and the problems that we're having. If we don't educate our young people about what happened on 9-11 and move forward with that in a positive way, how do we make tomorrow better without education? Uh, we can fight a war all we want, uh, but we also need to educate. Any other questions? Two questions. Um, are you affili affiliated with the museum downtown as well? Or is it like two separate entities? That's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up, actually. Um, I missed that in our queue but, um, of the slides. But we are a separate entity. Um, we work in partnership with the 9-11 Memorial Museum. Uh, our tours, um, a few years ago, we signed an agreement where we actually work together. Um, and we do a program in the museum auditorium now. We are a separate entity. We are privately funded. Um, as a nonprofit organization, so Lee and I are the ones that raise the money to support the organization um, and the, the facility that we have where people can come and, and hear the stories. So we are a separate entity, but we do work closely together. We shared a lot of our artifacts and con contributions from the families with the museum, um, if you've been there. It's a wonderful facility. Um, it's, it's really a museum. Um, it's sort of like the Smithsonian for those who haven't been actually down. I encourage you to go. Um, it's really comprehensive. Um, I would say it's, it's definitely a few hours of an experience uh, where the difference of Tribute Center is more it's the perspective of the community and the families and the personal sort of perspective. And it's about 30, 45 minutes of a, of a visit. So One of the things that, you would, oh, go ahead. that Jennifer was saying, uh, one of the... the um, backbone of the Tribute Center is that we've trained over 670 guides, all affected by 9-11, and they're able to come. Every day we do tours, seven days a week. They're able to come and tell their story. And some of you might realize that if, by telling the hurt that you hold inside, it becomes, it's, it's therapeutic, it's good for you, but it's also good for you, the people that come to the site that want to know what happened on 9-11. So 670 guides, and you have to hear their stories, powerful stories. I think you had one how, other question. How did you attain like the artifacts? Like, what was that process like? I, like, who owned like those? You know, like the remnants. Like, who owned that? Like, right. Mo most of the artifacts that are actually from the site came from the New York State Museum, so they're on loan to us from the State Museum. Um, in Gallery Four, we actually have a tribute to the victims, and those were all photographs and objects that were shared by families directly. Um, to the Tribute Center, and those are the collection that we also shared with the museum um, before that they, they opened to have a representation of everyone. So um, it's, it's a tough gallery, but it's actually quite beautiful because, you know, you can look at a wall of 3,000 names, but when you actually see a photograph of someone as their family remembered them at a birthday or a wedding or, a, you know, throughout their life, their hobby, their job, doing what they love to do, it's sort of as their family remembers them, not as a victim of a tragedy. So, our, our gallery four that Jennifer made reference to, uh, Jennifer reached out to family and said to family, send us one photo, perhaps your favorite photo. So gallery four is a photo of smiles, that everybody's smiling, right? But they can't smile anymore. When we leave gallery four, we, leave, we progress through and into gallery five, we want you to start changing. We want you to understand about those scholarships that are out there, about the foundations that were started. We want you to see tiles that have beautiful colors. We want you to see the last origami crane made by this little girl, Sadako, who was in Hiroshima when the bomb was dropped, and beautiful origami cranes that have come from Japan. Gallery 5 speaks positive. We want you to leave with the thought that you can make a difference tomorrow. And by leaving you today, shortly, you can make a difference tomorrow by your voice. If we don't do that, then for me, anyhow, I, I think we, we fail the future generations by not talking positive, by understanding, by teaching. Thank you. That was a good question. Anyone else? All right, now you have to get back to work. <laughs> Thank Listen, you so I, I, much for your time and for coming out to share with us. I, we really I, appreciate it. I'm going to take a chance now. Uh, Tim's not here, right? The boss? <laughs> right? Good. I spoke to Tim before, and he said, you can stay here. 
if you want to, we do have a video if you wanted to watch it. It's a, a Gallery 3 video. It's a five minute video. Josh, do we have that? I have it on my thumb if you don't. I didn't hear what he said. But I think we're, uh, for those of you that want to leave, we're going to step down um, okay. and you can get going. So, okay.